Munchkin or first Munchkin Baptist Church or any of those combinations you can find it on Queen Street. I don't remember the exact address on the top of my head. <laughs> United Baptist Church. First United Baptist Church. Yeah, that was me. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Um, so, uh, thank you all for returning. I should probably start with that. So, uh, we are going to be having uh, Dr. Richard Jackson now present on the Old Testament and Contemporary Christian Preaching. Uh, Dr. Richard Jackson is the Senior Pastor of First Function United Baptist Church and an adjunct professor of Cranville University. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in English from Dalhousie University, a Master's of Religious Education and a Master's of Divinity from Acadia Divinity College, a PhD in Church and Community from the Southern Baptist Seminaries. He is also, uh, until recently, been a columnist writing on a variety of topics to religion from Times and Transcript, and has been a contributor to Preaching Magazine and the book of the Minister's Manual. Um, so I'm going to pray, and then uh, uh, I'll invite Dr. Reverend Dr. Richard Jackson to uh, come up. God, thank you for uh, just the opportunity we have for having Dr. Reverend Richard Jackson here today with us today. Uh, bless his words and help them to um, allow us to ask the difficult questions and to uh, just be able to have reason in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and I should also uh, remind you, uh, we have those slips of papers for questions. And also, if you're viewing us online, uh, you can put your questions in the comments of the video, as well as uh, text me the questions personally. Personally, my number once again is 613-922-7623, 613-922-7623. All right, and without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Richard, Reverend Dr. Richard Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> I tell my congregation, you can call me Reverend Rick or Dr. Dick. <laughs> I'm going to move this over so that I can see if I'm actually putting the right um, slides up or not. And, oh. <laughs> right there, you're okay, good. Is this okay? Just need you in frame. <laughs> okay. I'll take my watch off so I can keep track of the uh, time as well. A lot of things to coordinate here. I don't think it is anyone's dream to follow Dr. Dempster. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not mine. I will say this: I am. It's. I've all. I've learned in 20 plus years of ministry that it's always best to lower expectations as much as possible. So I will say I am not an Old Testament scholar. I am not a homiletician, which is why I'm preaching, I'm speaking on preaching from the Old Testament. But what I am is a pastor in the trenches who has worked for many years trying to help the church understand its mission and to relate the Old Testament to the contemporary church. And as such, uh, as I prepared this, not being a scholar, I have relied heavily on those who are scholars. And uh, if there's anything in my presentation that you like, it's probably because of the scholars that I've referred to. There's two uh, who I have relied on very heavily for this presentation. And uh, I'm hoping that what I say today will whet your appetites a little bit. Um, one of them is by Lee Beach, who wrote a book, The Church in Exile, Living in Hope After Christendom. Wonderful, wonderful book relied on him heavily. The second one, we are actually studying as a lead team at my church, and that is Joining God, Remaking Church, Changing the World, The New Shape of the Church in Our Time by Alan Roxburgh. And again, I rely 
heavily on him uh, through this presentation. So I give them all the all the credit for anything good that comes out of this. Let me ask you. I'm going to have a little bit of involvement here. My people from my own church, they're used to this. Put you on the spot here. How many of you were born between the years 1925 and 1945? A few of you. There is a 60% chance that you are involved in church today. How many of you were born between 1946 and 1964? I just barely made it myself. I was born in 64. There is a 40% chance that you are involved in a church today. How many of you were born between 1965 and 1983? number of you, there is a 20% chance that you are involved in a church today. And how many of you were born after 1984? Quite a number of you. There is less than a 10% chance that you are involved in church today. The church today is in crisis in North America. And the question that many pastors, many scholars, many theologians, or many Christians are dealing with is how, what is the change that's taken place, and how do we turn the church around? The change can be understood very simply between what happened between two events. The first one occurred on July 1st. 1967. What happened on July 1st, 1967? There you go. The uh, That's, uh, by the way, Ted Newell's mother right there. So you can see where Ted gets his uh, smarts from. It was Canada's 100th anniversary. It was a beautiful summer day in our nation's capital. On that day, television viewers across the nation would have witnessed a crowd of 25,000 people gathered to celebrate Canada's 100th birthday. The centerpiece of the day's festivities was a prayer service. So this is a, a nationwide gathering, and the centerpiece is prayer. Various dignitaries attended the service, including the Prime Minister, members of the Cabinet, and members of the Senate. The guests of honor, the guest of honor at the ceremony was none other than Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, who arrived accompanied by her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, and as they ascended the platform, they were greeted by eight members of the clergy who escorted them to their respective seats. The service consisted of readings from a selection of Bible passages, including a reading by then Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, who read from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 14. Christian hymns were sung, prayers were offered, including a prayer of confession for the sins of the nation and a recitation of the Lord's Prayer nationally. Following this, a litany was recited, and those gathered were invited to respond with the words, We rededicate ourselves, O Lord. The meaning behind this service could not have been clearer. Canada is a Christian nation. And the Christian faith is central to our common identity. 34 years later, another national gathering took place in front of the Parliament buildings. The date of this gathering was September 14, 2001. Can you, can you remember why they would have gathered? Three days later following 9-11, three days after the attacks on the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington. In fact, my wife and I were living just uh, outside Philadelphia when those attacks occurred. A day that's come to be known worldwide simply as 9-11. On that somber day, three days after the attacks, Nearly 100,000 people gathered on Parliament Hill to mourn and to remember. The service that day was telling in terms of demonstrating the huge cultural shift 
that had taken place in our national identity between those two services, 34 years. In fact, those old enough to remember the 1967 service, it was clear to them that Canada had entered a new epoch. No longer was the Christian faith the cornerstone of the service. Representatives from several different religions were seated on the platform, but no Christian clergy, and indeed no leader from any faith, was invited to participate in the service in any way. Had you attended the service, you would have heard no scriptures read, no prayers offered, no hymns sung. Indeed, the only reference to religion at all was the Prime Minister's remark that in times like this, he said, we cling to our humanity and our common goodness, and above all, to our prayers. The contrast between the 1967 and the 2001 gatherings is stark. Each ceremony represented a particular era and demonstrated how drastically Canada had changed as a nation within the span of a single generation. If the Canada of the early to mid 20th century reflected a Christian self-identity and an acknowledgement of a perceived common Christian heritage, the Canada of the 21st century is one dominated by a new paradigm that has come to be known as postmodernism. Under this new worldview, no one religious faith is given prominence over any other. Indeed, postmodernism calls into question the legitimacy and relevance of all kinds of organized religion. As I just described, even at a time of national mourning, of grieving, following a heartrending tragedy, religion was viewed as largely superfluous to the grieving process. By the way, this shift in paradigms I'm talking about is taking place south of the border as well. Following the events of 9-11, for instance, a few people still looked to Billy Graham for pastoral care, but many others focused their attention on a new pastor, Oprah Winfrey. She took center stage through this period of mourning in the United States. Welcome, folks, to our new postmodern world. The church, which at one time stood at the center of Western culture and wielded formidable power, now finds itself relegated to the periphery of our culture. Now, I'm not one of those who views as our culture as necessarily hostile to the Christian faith, although there is some of that. Hostility, however, involves strong emotion. It's worse than that. It's not that our culture is hostile to Christianity, it's apathetic to it. Today, large segments of our culture view the church as at best a charming relic of a bygone era. Our culture today is not rejecting Christianity because you can't reject something you don't understand. There is no common ground to unite us as a culture on which people can base their opinion on the Christian faith. It used to be if you talked about someone being in a David and Goliath battle, people would understand. Or if, if someone was going through a struggle and he said, I feel like Daniel in the lion's den, people would understand what they were talking about. There's no understanding now. When, I, when I, my wife and I were pastoring in Philadelphia, we had a young woman contact us. She was about 18 years old. And uh, she found herself pregnant. And she wanted to raise her baby in a Christian home. And uh, she... She said, I'm trying to read the Bible, but I don't have any hooks to put anything on. Can you help me understand? So we invited her over one night, and we were going through the Bible with her, and, and I was talking about Adam and Eve, and I talked about Abraham and Moses, and, and got a little bit on a roll, and talked about Joshua and the prophets, and, 
And uh, finally, I got to the New Testament. I talked about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. And she stopped me. And, and this young woman, who had a church background, not our church, but a church background, said to me, I, I think I understand what you're saying, Pastor, but I want to make sure. She said, you're saying Jesus was born in Bethlehem? And I said, yes. She said, now, was that before or after Adam and Eve? People don't have the most basic knowledge. A while back, I was getting my hair cut. And the hairstylist asked me what I did for a living. And I sometimes avoid telling people because they get a strange look. But I thought I would give it a try this time. I told her I was a pastor. And she said, oh, you're a pastor. Well, there's a question I've always wanted to ask a pastor. And I thought, oh, Lord, give me strength. <laughs> she had scissors in her hand. I just wanted her to focus on the <laughs> I said, well, I said, this is your chance. What, what is, what's your question? She said, I want to know why my book didn't make it. I said, what, what do you mean, your book? What, well, my book didn't make it. And I had no idea what she was talking about. She, she, she continued on, my name is Ruth. And I said, okay. And she said, I, I, I want to know why my book didn't make it. Well, I, I couldn't figure it out right away. It took about 10 minutes. And I finally understood what she was saying. She knew that the Old Testament contained the book of Ruth. And she thought the New Testament was a revised version of the Old Testament. And she wondered why her book, Ruth, hadn't made the cut to the shorter New Testament. This is the postmodern world that we're living in today. There's nothing, there's nothing that we can assume with our culture. Now, why am I emphasizing this today? Because it highlights what I believe is the central challenge facing churches today. The struggle to redefine themselves and engage a postmodern culture in such a way as to once again make ourselves relevant to our culture. And I want to suggest to you that for a church on the periphery of our culture, struggling to find relevance, struggling to find out how to engage our culture, there is no better place to start than in the texts of the Old Testament. I want to suggest to you that the situation that the contemporary church finds itself in is similar to that of ancient Israel. Specifically, I want to introduce you to an Old Testament word that you all know, but may never have considered in this context until a few minutes ago when Dr. Dempster stole my thunder. But I will promise you, we did not coordinate our messages. But he, he had a wonderful segue for me. I want to suggest to you that the Old Testament idea of Exile offers one of the most helpful gateways for a church struggling to redefine itself in this new historical era we call postmodernism. So what does the word exile mean? Dr. Dr. Dempster spoke about this. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines exile as the state or period of forced absence from one's country or home. A forced absence from one's country or home. And so to be in exile is to have been forcibly removed from one's home. Certainly, ancient Israel knew all about exile. The Old Testament covers the period of two great exiles. The first, the Assyrian exile, began around 740 BCE and lasted about 20 years. During that period, several thousand Israelites of ancient Samaria were taken captive and forcibly relocated to Assyria. The second, Babylonian exile, involved three deportations of the people of Judah to Babylon beginning around 597 BCE. It's difficult to overestimate the degree of trauma these exilic experiences created in those who endured them. I'm sorry, I forgot about keeping this up. Did they, that's the first exile? 
And that's the second one. Had you been visiting Jerusalem in 587 BCE, you would have witnessed a marauding Babylonian army completely overrunning your city. You would have witnessed friends, neighbors, and family members beaten, raped, and murdered. You would have seen homes destroyed, possessions carried off, and the city in flames. Not content with wreaking havoc on homes and possessions, the Babylonians completely destroyed the Jerusalem temple, the one built and dedicated centuries earlier by Solomon, son of David. In the minds of the Babylonians, as well as many Israelites, the destruction of the temple represented not only the victory of Babylon over Judah, but even more significantly, the total dominance of their god, Marduk, over Israel's god, Yahweh. The experience of the destruction of the temple and of the subsequent exile was a defining experience for the nation of Israel. Those forced into, into exile were transported away from the only land they had ever known to a country utterly foreign to them. There, as part of a subjugated people, they lived among a people who spoke a different language, practiced strange customs, some of which they had been brought up to detest, and worshipped different gods. And it was there that these Israelites would spend the rest of their lives. In exile, the Israelites had to formulate and give expression to a new theology. A theology that in a foreign land would explain and give relevance to their faith. No longer were they living in a theocracy. No longer was the temple the center of their national life. Ultimately, the Israelites had to come to understand what does it mean to be God's chosen people amidst exile, subjugation, and a demolished temple. The Israelites went from being a people whose religion was the centerpiece of their national and cultural identity to being a people whose faith was considered weak, irrelevant, and consequently was pushed to the margins of the culture. Consider the questions this would have raised in the minds and hearts, and perhaps in the minds and hearts of every Israelite, especially the most devout ones. They would have wondered, does exile mean that the covenant of God with his people has been abolished? They had to figure that out. Is Israel no longer God's chosen people? Are we just another nation now? Has Yahweh abandoned Israel? Can you imagine any more heart-wrenching questions? You see where I'm going with this? I want to suggest to you that for the Israelites, Exile involved more than simply geographical displacement. It involved cultural and spiritual dislocation. The exilic Jews found themselves not just in a foreign country, but in a culture alien to their own amidst a people whose values were hostile to their own. In this respect, the Jewish experience of exile is similar to what Canadian Christians, especially evangelical Christians, are experiencing in the 21st century. In a profound sense, Canadian Christians in the 21st century are a people in exile. Not geographical exile, we're still in our homeland, but a cultural and spiritual exile, where our beliefs, values, and behaviors run counter to the dominant culture. For many of us, this is a new experience. 
As we saw just one or two generations ago, the Christian faith was at the center of our culture, and Christian values were at least acknowledged, if not always followed. Today, we live in the midst of a culture that is, as I said, if not hostile, at least apathetic. We've been pushed to the margins of our culture and we're viewed with suspicion and skepticism. So what are we to do? Since at least the 1970s, a lot of hand-wringing has been going on and a lot of strategies developed to get the church back to what we have viewed as our rightful place, back to the very heart of our culture. In his book that I pointed out earlier, Joining God, Remaking Church, Changing the World, Alan Roxburgh gives us a succinct summary of attempts by Christians to address this marginalization of the church. In the 1970s, the mantra of churches in North America was renewal, organizational renewal, program renewal, worship renewal, every kind of renewal imaginable. By the mid-70s into the 80s, the call for renewal was replaced by a call for and an emphasis on church growth. Denominations, universities, parachurch organizations sent out armies of church growth consultants who fanned out across the continent holding workshops and training events <coughs> trying to help plateaued churches get off the plateau. By the latter part of the 80s into the 90s, church growth had been replaced by an emphasis on church health. The basic idea is that if a church is healthy, it will naturally grow. A key player in this movement was natural church development, something our own church did a number of years ago. By the turn of the millennium, church health was replaced by the emergent church. A broad coalition of younger leaders seeking to develop a new kind of Christianity with a culture and practices linked to earlier forms of Christianity. The emergent church fizzled out as quickly as it sprang up and was replaced by the missional church. This movement challenged churches to reorient themselves around their original missional vocation. Now my point is not to say that these movements were wrong or bad or had no place in contemporary church. These programs and strategies have helped thousands of churches to reach out to people in the name of Christ. The problem comes, though, when we regard these programs as panaceas designed to get the church back to the position it once held at the center of our culture. The formula goes this way. Okay? The formula goes this way. The church used to be the foundation of our culture, 1967. The church has now been marginalized. We can bring the church back to the center of our culture if we do this whatever this happens to be. Now this is where I'm going to get radical and controversial. I want to propose to you the possibility that perhaps in 21st century Canada, God no longer wants the church at the center of our culture. Is it possible that there are things that God can do in and through a church in exile, a church on the margins, that he cannot do through a church at the center of culture. For centuries, during an epic sociologists call Christendom, the church was at the heart of Western culture. This produced mixed results in regards to the church's mission and identity. Certainly some great things were accomplished. It was during the period of Christendom that hospitals were created. The African slave trade was abolished. 
and child labor laws were brought in. Of course, it was also during Christendom that the Crusades began, the Inquisition took place, and African Americans were regarded under the law as two-thirds persons. Even as long ago as 1972, historian John Webster Grant saw potential benefits to the marginalization of the church. He wrote, the church grew and permeated Greco-Roman society for centuries in the face of official hostility and mob hatred. And there are many who regard its adoption by Emperor Constantine as its greatest misfortune. A period of exile to the periphery of power might well release Christian energies that have been smothered for centuries. In some respects, this discussion may be academic. The simple fact is the church is no longer at the center of our culture. And we have two options. We can bemoan our lost status and do everything we can to get back to our rightful position. Or we can consider the possibility that the church is exactly where God wants it to be and go about the business of being salt and light in our world. I would suggest that we pursue the latter course. Indeed, it may be that the marginalization of the church offers us a unique opportunity to reevaluate what the church is supposed to be, what it's supposed to do, and ultimately where it fits in a new post-Christian society. So let's review. What have we learned so far? The church is no longer at the center of our culture. The epic of Christendom is over. The church has been marginalized and pushed to the periphery of our culture. To large swaths of our culture, the church is regarded as irrelevant and viewed with suspicion and skepticism. The church is in exile. So I want to give you right now a little test to find out if you're a Christian in exile. Four questions for you. You may be a Christian in exile if you don't feel at home in our culture. You may be a Christian in exile if your values are different from the values of those around you. You may be a Christian in exile if your life priorities are different from those around you. You may be a Christian in exile if your morals, ethics, and behavioral patterns are different from those around you. How many are in exile right here? <laughs> Quite a number. If you answered yes to any of these questions, you just might be a Christian in exile. And the question I want to challenge you with is this. How can you, how can we thrive in exile? How can the church thrive in exile? How can we be salt and light in exile? Certainly, to be salt and light in these days will require us to learn how to influence our culture from the margins. But where do we go to learn how to do this? We don't have any models, do we, of what it means to be salt and light from the margins? Yes, we do. <laughs> this question brings us back to the Old Testament. As we've already seen, exile is not a new experience for God's people. Indeed, the whole of the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, is a story of exile. For our purposes, purposes today, though, we're going to confine our investigation to the Old Testament. But remember, this is only meant to whet your appetite. So let me ask you a question. Someone shout it out. Who, if you were listening to Dr. Dempster, you already know the answer to this question. Who were the first exiles in the Bible? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Yes. They were the first 
2. However, in a long line of exiles running through the Torah and indeed the whole of the Old Testament, we could go on. When Adam and Eve's son, Cain, killed Abel, God punished him, saying, you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Noah became an exile of sorts when the world and culture he had known was swept away in a flood. The nations of the world were sent into a form of exile when at the Tower of Babel, God confused their languages so they could no longer understand one another. Show me how to do this, Cody. <laughs> okay, right here. There we go. Just, i got to start over now. <laughs> <laughs> so then the Tower of Babel, God confused their languages and dispersed the peoples. That's a form of exile. Isn't it? When God called the father of Israel, Abraham, what did he call him to do? In Genesis 12, God tells him, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. He sent, God sent Abraham into exile. Not as a punishment, but as a promise. We could go on. Hagar and Ishmael were sent into exile following the birth of Isaac. The story of Abraham's son, Isaac, is one of lonely wandering over the earth. Isaac's son, Jacob, became an exile when he left his home for fear of his brother Esau's vengeance, when Jacob stole Esau's birthright and blessing. Jacob's son, Joseph, became an exile when he was sold into slavery by his brothers and ended up in Egypt. Years later, his whole family became exiles when they came down to Egypt because of a famine. Over the next several centuries, the people of Israel experienced the worst form of exile, living as slaves in Egypt and being brutally treated. The book of Exodus begins with Charlton Heston. <laughs> begins with Moses. Moses was at least a triple exile. He became an exile from his own people when he was adopted by an Egyptian princess. He became an exile from Egypt after he killed an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew. And after 40 years in exile, Moses came back to Egypt, led his people out of slavery, and then spent another 40 years with his generation as an exile in the wilderness of Sinai as a result of the sin of his people. Indeed, it could be said that Moses died as an exile, having been forbidden from entering the holy, the promised land by Yahweh. It's not too much to say that one of the central themes of the Torah is that of exile. As Christians, we carry within us the language in history of exile. It's part of our DNA. Whether we recognize it or not, it's part of who we are. And throughout the rest of the Old Testament, oh, if we had time, we see the motif of exile re-emerging during and following the periods of the two great exiles I've already mentioned, the Babylonian exile and the Assyrian exile. What are the stories of Daniel, Esther, Jonah, Ezekiel, Nehemiah, Haggai, Obadiah, Joel, Malachi, and many others, if not stories of exile. So how did Israel survive these experiences of exile, <clears throat> especially following the two great exiles I've mentioned? In the book that I mentioned earlier, The Church in Exile, Lee Beach delineates three separate theological truths, three theological truths that helped post-exilic Israel maintain its identity and reorient itself to life in a state of exile. These three theological truths are, number one, this is how they formulated their understanding of being God's chosen people in exile. Number one, they said they discovered that God is with us 
even on foreign soil. You heard me say earlier, prior to the exile, the three symbols of God's presence with Israel were the promised land, the Davidic kingship, and the Jerusalem temple. These three, all three, of these covenant symbols were stripped from the people in exile. It left the Israelites wondering, where is God in the midst of this new reality? Were they still God's chosen people? Is the covenant still in effect? Has Yahweh abandoned us? The answer from the prophets was unequivocal. The people may have abandoned Yahweh, but Yahweh has not abandoned his people. Yes, it is true, the prophet said. God has sent us into exile. But God is with us, even on foreign soil. The mystical vision of Ezekiel 1, that I always get asked about as a pastor, where God is depicted on wheels as his glory departs the temple, may be showing God going into exile with his people. Later in Ezekiel 10, we see the glory of Yahweh leaving the temple to be with the exiles in Babylon. In Jeremiah 29, a similar theme is presented in a different way, where the Israelites are instructed to work for the good of Babylon. Jeremiah predicts ultimate deliverance from Babylon for the Israelites, but insists that until then, the exiles must seek the good of their new homeland. This image of God being in exile with his people was one that was reinforced by all the post-exilic prophets and was the foundation of hope for Israel. If God was truly in exile with his people, then that meant that God had not abandoned his people. The covenant still stood and they were still God's chosen people. This is a message that our people today need to hear from our pulpits. Yes, it is true that the church is no longer the center of our culture. It is true that we've been marginalized, pushed to the periphery, viewed with suspicion. It's true that the vast majority of our churches are no longer the size they were in the 40s or 50s or 60s. But this does not mean that we have failed God. It certainly does not mean that God has failed us. Indeed, as with Israel, it may provide us with opportunities for ministry and influence unimagined by previous generations. In our preaching, we need to encourage our people to stop the hand-wringing and pining for the good old days and recognize that God is working in our midst, even in exile. The first theological truth that helped Israel to survive as a people in exile is that God is with us even on foreign soil. The second theological truth that help them survive is that God is calling his people to live lives of counter-cultural holiness. In addition to reminding their people that God was with them even on foreign soil, the Hebrew prophets also called for their people to distinguish themselves as set apart in their pursuit of holiness. Their moral and ethical behavior was to unify them as God's people and be a witness against the surrounding culture. We see this embodied in the book of Daniel, where the virtue and holiness of Daniel and his three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, set them apart from everyone else in Babylon. At times, the quality of these four men's lives bring praise upon them. At other times, it brings persecution and threats of death. But through it all, their holiness sets them apart as different from their surrounding culture and as followers of Yahweh. 
and Babylon for Daniel, Daniel and his companions. Their values, their priorities, their strange behavior was the language of nonconformity. I hope that you can see the relevance of this to our preaching ministry in the 21st century church. Do not our people in exile need to hear this call? Yes, we are in exile. Yes, we've been marginalized. Yes, we're viewed as irrelevant. While it is true that we may no longer be among the power brokers in our culture, God still has a mission for us, and that mission is to be a city on a hill. We are still the salt of the earth. We are still the light of the world. Indeed, it may be that the ultimate influence of the church on the culture will be even greater from the margins than it ever was at the center of our culture. But only, only if we pursue counter-cultural holiness as single-mindedly as did Daniel and his companions. What helped them survive? God is calling his people to live lives of countercultural holiness. And number three, we are still a mission people. One of the most unexpected yet far reaching results of the exile was Israel's sense of being a people with a mission. Perhaps surprisingly to some, the experience of exile brought about a renewed conviction that part of being the chosen people of God meant declaring the supremacy of Yahweh among the nations of the world. This is most clearly seen in Isaiah, where the prophet calls on his people to once again be the light to the nations. Isaiah is my wife, and that's favorite book of the Bible. And she loves this passage, taken from Isaiah chapter 42, beginning at verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. In exile, they had more of a sense of mission than they ever did when they were on their own home soil amidst their own temple and their own people. I don't know. To me, that will preach. What power is in those words? What a vision. What a challenge. Yet those words were spoken in the midst of exile. Another example from Isaiah. Chapter 49. God says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. He says, it's too small just for me to restore Israel. You're going to be a light to the entire world, to shine to all the Gentiles. The point I want you to grasp is this. It took Israel being in exile for them to begin to reflect on their responsibility to people outside their own narrow circle. Mm -hmm. Isaiah was calling on the exiles to stop living in a bubble and start embracing their God-given mission to the Gentiles. Could it be, could it be that the cultural marginalization of the church is God's way of calling the church back to its God-given vocation as found in the Great Commission and other passages. Could it be that it's too easy for the church to forget why it exists 
when it abides in the halls of secular power and influence. Mm -hmm. And if your mind is wandering to the American political scene right now, that's okay. Let it wander. <laughs> Do you see what Isaiah was doing in these passages? He was reorienting the sense of defeat that exiles naturally feel into a clarion call of victory where the conquerors will be converted to the faith of the conquered. Mm -hmm. Don't miss how countercultural this was. In the ancient world, gods were assumed to reside in a particular territory. So the defeat of one nation by another was viewed as the defeat of one god by another. Isaiah not only rejects the view that, I, that Yahweh had been defeated, he maintains that this apparent defeat is actually the means by which Yahweh will transform pagan nations into worshipers of Yahweh. Nothing could be more countercultural. Are there preachers today, are there churches today, who will take up the challenge to proclaim that our God is the God of the marginalized? Are there preachers today who will declare that the cultural marginalization of the church is not the end of the church, but a new beginning for her? Are there preachers today who will declare that far from forsaking the church, God is preparing for her a glorious future, not in terms of political power, but of influence from the margin? I hope that you're beginning to see the relevance of the Old Testament to a church in exile. I hope that you're catching a vision as to how the, the preaching ministry of the church, the church's mission, can grow out of these Old Testament texts and can give new life and vitality to the church. I'm conscious of the time here. I'm going to say a little bit more. I have a little bit of time left. In order to be effective, however, I've talked about truth, I hope. But in order to be effective, truth must be embodied. The principles set forth by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other prophets had to be fleshed out in the everyday lives of people seeking to follow Yahweh in the midst of exile. Teaching is one thing. Embodied teaching is another. Consequently, in order to embody this teaching of the God of the exiles, the biblical writers developed a narrative device known as the Diasporic Advice Tale. The Diasporic Advice Tale. These advice tales, these stories, show the, show the exiles how one could faithfully follow Yahweh in exile and amidst the challenges of life on the margins. One of these advice tales is the book of Esther. <coughs> Esther, if you've read the book, if you haven't, read it tonight, it's not a long book was a marginalized Jewish girl living in the powerful empire of Persia. Just as people today in a marginalized church might wonder if our days are numbered, the exiled Jews in Persia wondered if the Jewish people had a future. The book of Esther is famous for being what? The only book where the name of God is not mentioned. Now, some scholars have taken this fact to mean that Esther is a secular book, has no place in the Bible. Other scholars, however, see the very absence of God as evidence of God's subversive activity. For exilic Jews, as well as 21st century Christians, God can often seem conspicuous by his absence. Esther reminds us, however, that God often comes to the aid of his people in ways that are only discernible in retrospect. In other words, many scholars believe that the author of this book goes to great length 
to avoid mentioning the name of God precisely in order to acknowledge the perceived abandonment of the exilic community while simultaneously reminding them of God's hidden activity. Wow! But that will preach. <laughs> Christians today are witnessing the marginalization of the church. We see powerful forces at work in our culture running contrary to the will of God. We see evil running rampant and oppression seemingly winning the day. We naturally wonder why God does not show himself more powerfully, more visibly. Ultimately, exile can lead us to doubt the very presence of God. And it is this doubt that the book of Esther was written to address. Esther reminds us that though we cannot always see God's visible activity, nevertheless, he is right here with us in exile, working to accomplish his will. Esther teaches us one other lesson as well. Esther provides a model for cultural engagement in situations where one has little political influence or clout. Esther models how one can be a fully functioning member of society while maintaining humility and a proper perspective on life. Even Esther's womanhood reminds us how one can maintain one's dignity and morality, even in the context of a subordinate population. Ultimately, Esther's message for the Western Church is that it is from the margins of society that God often does his best work. I'm running out of time here. I was going to talk a little bit about Daniel and a little bit about Jonah, um, but I'll save those for another time. I want to conclude, there's Daniel, Jonah. I want to conclude on a, a positive note, a note of victory. The book of Revelation, which I recently took my congregation through over a, a two-year period, reminds us that exile is not a permanent condition for the church. Revelation reminds us that the day is coming when we shall no longer be in exile, when we shall witness our eternal home, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. On that day we shall be exiles no more. For the first time we shall be truly home. Until that day may we no longer pine for a bygone era nor for a position in society that may not have been the best or the healthiest for the church. Instead, let us learn from the exiled believers of the Old Testament what it means to impact our culture from the margin. And may our preaching and our witness reflect the hope and mission that is ours as an exiled church. Cody had asked me to um, close in prayer, and uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to add another prayer to what I was going to pray, because um, my wife, Yvette, just let me know that some of you may not have heard that there's been a shooting at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and at least eight and possibly more people have been killed. And so on this day, as we recognize... Um, the amazing history of the Jewish people and all the persecution that they've gone through, as you can see in the scorch marks on this scroll, uh, the Jewish community in 2018 is still being persecuted. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this conference that we've, this symposium that we've had together, and as many have already. Uh, said, we thank Cody Guitar especially for all the work that he has put into this. And uh, we thank you for, for the, the lessons that we've learned, for the truths that you sought to teach us, and pray that uh, you would continue to, to lead us as a church in the direction that you want us to go in. And Lord, even now, we pray uh, for our Jewish brethren 
We pray especially for the people in that synagogue in Pittsburgh who have experienced such great loss and even more persecution. We pray, Lord, that you would bring people into their lives who can speak a word of hope and encouragement to them. We pray that the Christian community in Pittsburgh would, would surround them and embrace them and do everything they can to support them. And may they speak out publicly in support of the Jewish people. And Lord, may we, as we follow you in the midst of exile, continue to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name. Well, thank you, Dr. Reverend uh, Richard Jackson. So, um, oh, this is the wrong page. Uh, so, we're going to be going into about a around a fifteen-minute intermission before our time for questions. A uh, reminder that the uh, scroll scroll will be open for viewing. Um, Oh yes, and a reminder, of course, that we can't be touching the scroll. Uh, there's no food or drink around and allowed in the area, as well as uh, no small children. Uh, so if you guys would like to return around 4:30 for our hour, oh actually, it'd be close to around 4:40 for our Q&A pa panel. Uh, that would be great. Thank you.